Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Ty Brown Show. I'm here with our special guest, Stephen Merrill, today. We are revisiting leadership and some of the critical elements of our communication. Uh, really, good leadership is all about someone who's a real effective communicator. So we're going to dive into that today. I hope you're ready. Podcasting from conciliators, this is The Ty Brown Show. If you're a human and you think you might have to interact with other humans at some point and you like that to go well, then listen up. Oh, yeah. It's time to get cozy with conflict. Let's go. All right, folks, it's time for the stats of the week. It's a good week, everybody. I was getting worried that we may not cross our threshold and I, I was getting worried that we might end up dipping down, but we didn't. We are up to 1,364 listeners. So the dispute resolution revolution marches on. No one can stop us. All right. Thanks Thanks again for sharing this with everyone you know and, and tuning in each week. I hope you're developing some skills that are improving your life and making things go just a little better in those human interactions. That's the whole goal of this podcast. Um, keep submitting questions, uh, whether, that, whether you do that through social media or, uh, or you can uh, email me, uh, send it to my personal email. The show's email still down, so send it to, uh, just send it to my personal email at um, to ty2brown at gmail.com. Okay, so uh, I did get a question that I wanted to go over uh, this week, and it's something that really deserves a lot more time than I'm going to give it today, uh, but it's something I'm sure you can relate to. Listener says this, why have a learning conversation if you know you're right and you know they're wrong? What a great question, right? It, it, aren't there some times where right is right and wrong is wrong? The answer to this, of course, is yes, there are times. Um, but the question wasn't whether there are times when that's the case. The question was why still engage in a learning conversation? And the reason why you might do that is if your hope is to persuade somebody if your hope is to open their eyes a little bit and get them to understand you, then you may need to first help them to know that you understand them before they're willing to go there and understand you. So the why is, is really, you know, if your intention is to persuade or to change, um, then there's not really a, a good way of doing that by making the I'm right, you're wrong statement. Uh, example that comes to mind. I, I thought, I think I may have shared this before, uh, speaking to a neighbor of mine, his daughter was smoking, teenage daughter smoking, right? Uh, he knows that smoking is bad. She knows that smoking is bad for her health. She's been taught that. She believes that. But him being right about it, her being wrong about it, doesn't change her, doesn't make her stop smoking, right? And they had had that discussion to no avail. But as soon as as soon as they dove in and, and really tried to figure out as soon as my neighbor was willing to go and talk to her and figure out really what was going on in her life, um, why was she doing it and, um, and and really figure out what was so important to her, things started happening. She started opening up to his perspective as a father and kind of stopped resisting this reality that, you know what, my father actually cares for me. He's worried about me. Uh, finally, I can accept that because I know he cares about me and he worries about me too. Um, so that's that's my thoughts on, on answering that. And we'll dive into more of that a, another day. Uh, but for now, just know that if you want to be persuasive, the best way to do that is to convince someone that you fully understand them and you still conclude differently because then they're going to start feeling like, uh-oh, someone gets me and they still think I'm wrong. <laughs> and that's that's a vulnerable place to be. And that's when we start to, to change our minds on things. So those are my thoughts on that. So now, everybody, this is what you've all been waiting for, right? Who is this mysterious guest we've got? Well, I'll tell you. This is Stephen Merrill. Stephen Merrill, is, oh boy, what a background he's got. So he's studied mathematics, got a bachelor's degree there, went and got an MBA, uh, and rather than stopping there, went and got a Ph.D. in organizational leadership. So if there was anyone who could ever comment and really pick apart this podcast and figure out all the lies I've been telling you, 
it's Steve. All right. So everybody listen up. Steve, Steve works primarily as a leadership consultant for organizations who are looking to, to take their leaders to the next level and work through a lot of the challenges that are inherent in leadership. Steve's devoted a lot of his professional career and a lot of his academic study to these kinds of questions. And, and let me tell you, that is, it is so relevant to dispute resolution. It's so relevant to the communication skills we've been trying to learn. So specifically, Steve's developed some, uh, some relationship factors of leadership. And that's where we're going to kind of jump into this, uh, into the segment with Steve. So, uh, Steve, will you just tell us a little bit about what these factors are? You bet. Um, you can remember them by pace, partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation, uh, partnership being exactly what it sounds like, uh, being at the same level as the individual. You're not telling, you're not dictating, you're not flashing your title, uh, you're not educating or anything like that. You're taking a step down and being with the person uh, and, and letting them know that you're there to leverage expertise together and uh, work on the problem uh, in a unified way. Acceptance, uh, it's got four components to it. First is absolute worth. We are all human beings. We all breathe air, we buy groceries, we wanna go on vacation with uh, our families. Those things, we're, we are all humans. Next is autonomy. We respect one another's autonomy. No one, no one wants to be told how to do it, when to do it, what color to make it, and all of those things. We want our freedom to choose. There's affirmation. We want to be affirmed in our good decisions, in our efforts, the things that we're trying to do. And lastly, there is accurate empathy, and that, that's just not judging one another. Uh, understanding, clearly, one another's differences, but at the same time, just accepting them neutrally. We don't have to accept or endorse that uh, someone's an axe murderer, but we put it on the table as a fact and and we just let it be there and try not to judge and, and react. Uh, so those are the, the components of acceptance. Uh, next is compassion. Compassion is having someone else's back. That is walking by Ty's office and see him feverishly working on the podcast or something like that. And if I'm Ty's supervisor, I can, I can uh, ask, hey, how's it going? He says, oh, it's, it's good. I've got a few things I'm wrapping up. So maybe I step into the next office and I turn on the laptop. I test the microphone. I make sure that everything's good. And I walk back and say, hey, Ty, I, I know you're, you're working on this. I step next door, I'm, you're good to go. The laptop's up and ready. You can just step up to the mic and start recording your podcast. That's taking time out of my schedule to have his back and have compassion and make things a little easier on him. And then finally, evoking. Uh, that's to draw out, to distill rather than instill we're asking these wonderful, deep, rich questions and uh, inviting someone to ponder, to dig in and remember. Uh, for example, in a, in a work setting, uh, there's a business issue and you can ask, uh, hey John, you ever encountered this? Wow, it's been 20 years, but yeah, when I was over at Acme, we did this. It, it, it's not quite the same, but you know, this is what we did. Well, what do you think we can do? How can we spin that? How can we fit our business issue? And so when you evoke, you draw out all that wonderful experience and talent and skills, that, that wisdom uh, that they've got, because you're willing to listen. You're willing to be with the person and invite that, uh, that wonderful connection uh, that uh, comes when you actually listen and not listen to respond but uh, listen to more uh, understand and deeper understand the other person so that's uh, I, again you can remember it by pace 
uh, partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evoking. Excellent. That was a really, really helpful summary for us. Steve, I, I'm curious. I have actually a lot of questions as you're going through there, and I'm, I'm really glad we've, we've got you on for a few minutes so that we can, uh, boy, so that we can take these factors, make something of them. I know we've got a lot of listeners out there who are C-level executives, um, and surely a lot, of, a lot of listeners who have, uh, who just have a lot of need for these kinds of factors in their lives. So I'm wondering if you can uh, comment on a little bit kind of high-level objective the purpose as you were developing these factors what were you really trying to overcome what were you really trying to accomplish um, by developing this uh, I guess this framework we live in an electronic society where we are supposedly connected on Facebook we connect with friends on LinkedIn we connect with other professionals but I don't know that we're really connected. Are we? I'd, I'd say no. I'd say no. Uh, when, when someone reaches out to me on LinkedIn and says, Hey, it's Steve. I'd like to connect with you and add you to my network. I always accept, say thank you, and respond with a message that says something to the effect of, Thank you for connecting with me. I'm, I'm happy to be uh, on your list of, of professionals. But I try to be a little bit more than a name on a list. I am happy to share all of the research and experience that I have. I'm happy to be a sounding board. Whatever that may be, please use me. I'd, I'd like to not just be part of a name collector. I, I'm an individual. I have goofy attributes. I have <laughs> talents and skills and experience and, and all sorts of different things. Yeah. But I'd, I'd really love to share those and help and build someone. And that's, that's where, boy, the, the relationship, that's why I named it the relationship factors. The relationship is critical. When I was uh, doing my doctorate, I'd gotten my results. Uh, a mentor of mine, wonderful friend, Dr. Cameron John, he's the chair of psychology at UVU. Uh -huh. And I was reporting my, my results. And I told him, and he says, oh, Steve, you've, you've just proven what uh, all of us therapists kind of already knew. It's the relationship factor. That's the factor for success in the counseling profession. The, the recipes are all good. The principles are all good. But it's the relationship between the, the, the helper and the individual with the issues to be solved. I thought, oh, Cameron, that's it. it these are relationship factors. And so as we strengthen the relationships in work, family, school, wherever we may be, we invite oh, so much uh, of a better possibility of success in anything that we're going to do. Conflict resolution? Absolutely. If the relationship is better, it, it, we don't have to go to dinner together. Right. But if our relationship is better, then the chance of resolving this is much better, much higher. So that was my purpose, is to strengthen working relationships in, in particular. However, these principles are apl applicable in every re relationship, right? To accept one another, to partner with one another, to have compassion mm -hmm. for the other person, and to deeply listen and ask wonderful, wonderful questions. Yeah. So it, sound, it sounds to me like there were some other professional areas you, you talked about um wh where where did uh where did the uvu was it psychology what field yeah, he's, yeah, psychology, Psy psychology. He's, a, he's a clinical mental health counselor clinical okay so he was a mid, uh, clinical mental health counselor so it sounds like you kind of found other industries um and you're seeing gosh there's a lot of you know, you've got a you've got a business background an mba uh, you studied organizational leadership and you start thinking boy there are some there are some real important principles to be learned from these other industries that it could have really big implications in business. So I, as I'm hearing this, I'm wondering if there's a little more to the story about kind of where these factors came from. Um, could you kind of tell us about where they came from? Oh, absolutely. Uh, these are not mine. Uh, I am the first person to take them into the business community and study them. 
it, these uh, partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evoking, uh, these are principles from motivational interviewing in the counseling profession. When I was at uh, Argosy University, two of our strongest and most popular programs, master's degree programs, were clinical mental health counseling and marriage and family therapy. I was invited to um, a job interview. Uh -huh. A gentleman wanted to be a professor uh, for one of those programs. In his teaching demonstration, he taught the spirit of motivational interviewing, which is made up of these four components, partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evoking. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with him right then and there, thinking, this is just good leadership. This is how I want to be uh, dealt with in, in a working environment. If my leader were to be a partner with me, to invite me to reflect and ask me my opinion, if I knew that she had my back, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm coming in early every day. I'm going to stay late every day. I want that powerful relationship. Uh, and so I, it was there that I knew the direction of my dissertation. I was going to take those principles out of the counseling professions and test for them in the business environment. And so I, I thought, where, where am I going to test this? And I thought the best place I can go fishing would be in Utah Business Magazine's best businesses to work for. I thought, if, if, if I've got this hunch, I'll go in the best uh -huh. fishing place <laughs> I can think of here in Utah. And I, I wanted to know a few things. One, were those leadership traits there? Did those supervisors and leaders practice those traits? Yeah. The second question was, did anybody care? Do their teams want those? Yeah. I, I may be the only one. <laughs> and so I, I thought, do, are they important to those team members? The business tie to that was Hertzberg, uh, who was, uh, I think he retired from the U several years ago. Uh, and has since passed away, but he had a very famous leadership theory called the, the two-factor theory or the hygiene factor theory. And the, the top two uh, s job satisfaction factors were a sense of achievement and a sense of recognition. So I limited the scope of my, my study, and I wondered if partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evoking tied to a sense of achievement and a sense of recognition. Mm -hmm. um, so those were my four questions, um, and it came back incredibly successful. Yes, uh, those wonderful, powerful, great businesses here in Utah were indeed practicing the relationship factors. Teams wanted them. The surprising uh, note or, or bit of information that I discovered was these great companies weren't doing it enough. They, the teams wanted more, mm -hmm. more partnership, more acceptance, more compassion, more evoking, more involvement in the, in the business issues. Yeah. And they tied, nothing's perfect in statistics, but they tied so strongly to a sense of achievement and recognition. And uh, I had this thought, thinking back in my childhood, you know, when you, you make your Christmas present for your mom and dad when you're in second grade, and you mash your hand into that wet piece of clay and you lift your hand out and you look at it and you think oh my goodness this is a masterpiece there is nothing like it in in the world so you have that strong sense of achievement and immediately after you think this is going front and center on my Christmas tree I want everybody to see it I want that recognition that I am the next Pablo Picasso you crave it. We, we want that recognition. And so when I combined those, those factors uh, statistically, a, a partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evoking accounted for 62.2% of why a person feels a sense of achievement and recognition. Um, from our friends at OC Tanner who have done extraordinary work on recognition, they've demonstrated how important recognition is and, and how it drives engagement. I call engagement enthusiasm. That's the easiest word I can come up with. Like engagement at work is how enthusiastic are you? And so 
when I found that it, almost two-thirds of why a person has a sense of achievement and recognition, I knew that it, these needed to be taught and sh shared with other organizations because if these great businesses were still short, that their teams wanted more, they were doing a great job, mind you. They were fantastic, but the team still wanted more. I thought, oh, how much more so do other organizations want these, need these, mm -hmm. and how much more successful could an organization be if their leaders would practice those relationship mm -hmm. factors? Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for walking us through kind of how, how you arrived. Uh, at this discovery, which I think I think is actually a pretty significant discovery, um, because in you know in my work with uh, you know all the dispute resolution I do for businesses, uh, we don't have this exact framework. But I frankly I want to just steal it because we end up inevitably working with leaders who are struggling. They're having a hard time. They've got people beneath them that they're struggling with. They've got someone who who has an important role and the leader sees how they're doing and, and their perception is, you know what, they're falling short here, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to help them through this. I, I'm going to go and give them feedback and I know their reaction. They're going to be defensive. They're going to say, no, I'm not that way. And, and then, and then, oh, great. Now all I've done is just soured, you know, <laughs> soured the day, maybe the week. And uh, this little piece of negative feedback is going to carry over for days and days and days. Um, but, but look, these factors, if you can communicate using these as a leader, the reaction you get from other people will not be a reaction of defensiveness. Uh, it'll be a reaction of feeling recognized, appreciated, um, that your achievements are not going unnoticed. Uh, and ultimately, you're going to have the trust in your leader that you know what this person sees me as a person they understand me and it's okay for me to even admit like oh you know what i'm falling short here um probably need to make more of an effort and that's that you know that's a kind of a level of, of vulnerability that's hard to it's hard to create that unless there's a real systematic push using a framework like this so so anyway i i I'm a huge fan of these, and, and um, as you might suspect, this is not the first time I've heard the relationship factors uh, from Steve. But anyway, I, I hope you're taking notes, guys, um, especially if you have any leadership responsibilities, whether that's within a family uh, or within your community or your business. These are, these are principles that are going to help you. Even if you can't master them, just make an effort at them, and you'll see results, right? Yes. Right. Okay. And so let's let's talk about some of these factors specifically. I'm very curious to hear uh, some of the common leadership failures you observe. And maybe I don't know if it's easy. You can kind of go in whatever order you want. But maybe just starting, you know, at you know, in the pace framework, starting with partnership. Just kind of tell us what are the things that people mess up the most. Wow, partnership. That uh, that reminds me when I was in the Navy. I had a commanding officer, a very, very strong leader. Uh, I'll just leave that at that politically correct statement. And he was quoted <laughs> one once. Uh, th in, in the Navy, you can have what's called a captain's call. That's where uh, different levels of the organization will gather together and can hear from the captain. Ask him any questions they want. Hey, what's, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What's, what's going on? So forth. So you get it straight from so to speak, the old man's mouth, right? The, the skipper's mouth. And so we had uh, an all officers captain's call. We were in Panama at the time and uh, we were asking questions and he was, well, this is the way it is. And it was just his explanation and he was not going to budge. His way was the right way. Uh -huh. uh, he was actually quoted as saying, it's good to be the king. And uh, it, it, we, f we very quickly realize that don't ask any more questions. As soon as this meeting's over, <laughs> we can hit the beach. Yeah. We can go. We don't have to sit yeah. here and listen to this person who is clearly the king. Yeah. And so we, after a few bruised shield, uh, shins of, uh, you know, stop asking questions, we were able to, it's like, oh, that, that's, that's great, Skipper. That that's, sounds good, and then we were out. We were gone. S so there was not that level of buy-in from us because 
there was no input. There was no partnership. He was clearly the king, and we were not um, being accepted. Um, Can I interrupt? You? Oh, absolutely, please. please. Okay, so I, I, as you were talking, I had this thought. I had this thought that it should seem obvious to everyone, but it's, it's again, it's one of those things that's so simple that it's almost always overlooked. When you arrange these teams of individuals to accomplish a task, say you've got a big project and you, you, you assemble this team of all-stars and it's so funny because say, say you're in charge of this project, there is a real temptation to want to be the king, but the whole, the whole funny part about this is the reason we hire people, the reason we form teams is because something is inherently valuable about having all these other people that have these brains uh, that have great ideas and really great experience and, and so we bring these teams together very often we we completely overlook the value the whole reason we brought them in is so that they can speak up but in a lot of organizations there is a culture where it's like hey it's it's like the skipper right we don't talk the the skipper says how it is and then we all just go our way um, but that that is defeating the whole purpose of having employees you know why even have them why not just be a skipper on on a crusade right um so anyway i just it, it, this is like such a common thing that we see of a lot of leaders are very self-conscious about fostering an environment where people are really comfortable giving their input candidly but if you don't then you've missed the whole point of having a team so anyway um my thoughts on partnership so move on for us this is this is good love it one I'll, I'll share one thing that I learned today um, when when feedback is being given you may unconsciously tend to limit it here's here is a here's a way to to not limit that you can say I like I like I wonder when someone presents an idea I like this you know whatever it is I like that whatever it is and then in instead of picking apart the issues or what have you, because you've been there, you've got that experience, yeah. you, you've been around the block, you can pose that question. I wonder what this would look like if, and then go forward. It takes the defenses down. Yeah. Uh, anyone who's ever been told to do something has that, there is a wall that gets built up, sometimes not as high as others but nevertheless there could be that passive aggressive like I'm gonna drag my feet as long as I can and I'm not gonna do this even though if we know what's right yeah. you, you spoke of um, women and smoking and pregnancy and what have you the facts don't convince right. you've got the head which is data the heart and the hand the data doesn't necessarily convince but the heart and when we decide internally that it's that intrinsic motivation, that's the most powerful motivation there is. Money's a motivator, no question. Vacation time, a trip, whatever it may be. But when we decide in internally that we want to do something, boy, there's almost no stopping us. Uh, and then the hand. As we lead, take someone by the hand, partnership, we walk the path with them to help them maneuver uh, the the rocks the the waves whatever it may be uh, together you know it, it, there's great success um, you, you know speaking uh, the next one with acceptance I I'm thinking of a, a social group I'm part of um, happen to be the oldest of the, of the social group and as members joined that group mm -hmm. we were all kind of on a similar scale if you will career where we were in our careers education families. Everything was about the same. Uh -huh. The last member in this social group came, certainly the youngest, uh, just beginning a career, just beginning education, just beginning family. It was fascinating to me that any time we would be in the group talking, that individual was the loudest, he was the most vocal, the most opinionated. It was clear, and I after learning these principles I thought oh hello he just wants to be accepted that's that's all yeah. and I think of that in an organization the newest member of the team oh my goodness I've got all these other folks here who've been here so long they know so much more than me I've got to make an impact I need to make a name for myself 
And what is that? You know, after at work, we have our pens and pencils, right? That's our physiological needs, mm -hmm. our laptop, whatever it is that we need to do our job. If we are safe, right? The, you know, the building's not going to fall. The, the, the company's not going to go out of business. The next level on Maslow's hierarchy of needs is to be accepted, to be part of a group, to be loved. Mm -hmm. So at work, we're searching for that. Am I going to be part of the team? In our families, where, where do I fit in my family? We want desperately to be accepted at work, at home, in our, our peer groups, wherever that may be. It's, it's a real one. Um, personally, when I hear people, well, I don't need anybody, I'm a hermit, I'm, you know, just thank me twice a month with a paycheck, let me go home. I, I don't buy into that. There genuinely may be like three people on earth who don't need to be accepted, uh, but I think everyone else does. Um, Compassion-wise, oh, everyone, everyone wants to know that someone's looking out for them. When when someone will drop by your house with a plate of cookies and all they have to say is, you know what, Ty, I was thinking about you. Hope everything's well. Oh my goodness. How loyal, how devoted are you to that individual? Mm -hmm. It's a powerful connection. Um, Simon Sinek talks about, um, I think, the chemical oxytocin, mm -hmm. the service chemical, the leadership chemical. When we serve someone else, it releases a little bit of oxytocin in our brain and uh, counteracts the addictive properties of uh, the endorphins mm -hmm. and uh, dopamine. Mm -hmm. But the only way we can get oxytocin is for us to serve someone else. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool, when we do it in an organization and we see that the boss has one of our team members back, we get a shot of oxytocin also mm -hmm. and we have a, 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 an increased yeah, sense of loyalty amazing. to our boss yeah. when our boss serves us has that compassion we know that he took time out of his schedule her schedule to say hey how's it going it's like you know what i'm a wreck really tell me about it and she sits down and is engulfed in our conversation it's not work related at all my son has been sick for the past two days i'm worried sick He's dehydrated, blah, 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 whatever it may be. And the next thing you know, you know, a couple hours later, she shows up with a six pack of 7-Up saying, hey, here's some 7-Up, here's some Gatorade, take these home. Uh, you're probably out. Oh, my goodness. How powerful is that to know she has my back? Again, the, the loyalty, the trust, as you mentioned earlier, just goes through the roof when we practice these, these human connection principles. So quick thought, as you're talking about compassion, I, um, I, I'm thinking in my head, I thought, why, why is it hard for leaders to be compassionate? Or why is it hard for anyone, even if you're not a leader? Why is it hard to be, to show compassion, you know, to promote others' welfare above above your own. Um, I'm wondering specifically in the in the work context, speaking of a workplace, what are the barriers to showing compassion? What makes it hard in a, in a work scenario? Wow. Um, because we live in such a competitive world, where we're rated, for example, in the Navy, we were ranked. If I'm, I'm the top lieutenant, I'm the bottom lieutenant, and, and so forth. If you don't get a number one ranking as a lieutenant commander in, in your department head tour, you do not get command. Even if you're a great person, a fantastic leader, if, if you don't get that number one fit rep, you're done. You don't get command. So there's this incredible competition, this mentality, and, and we see it in business today, right? Yeah. Uh, there, if, if so-and-so does better than I do, then I don't get the promotion, I don't get the raise, I don't get whatever, fill in the blank. So to be compassionate, we think, wrongfully so, that it shows weakness or I'm not a great leader or I'm, I'm soft. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely not true. It will invigorate the team. It invigorates you. 
the team will be more successful, more creative, more productive, more trusting, more loyal. They won't steal from the company. It's less likely. All of these things that you want in business, mm -hmm. when you practice the relationship factors, those things increase. Uh, and, and the things that you don't want, absenteeism, um, theft, work-related accidents, things like that, decrease. Why? Because we're more enthusiastic. We're present. Mm -hmm. We're here at work. We're paying attention. We don't get our hand caught in a fan belt, mm -hmm. right? Because we're paying attention to our job. That was, that was a true story of, uh, <laughs> of a, oh boy. A, a, <laughs> an automotive shop where one of the technicians got his hand caught in a running motor. Why? His mind somewhere else? I, I don't know. Was he fully engaged in his work, in the task at hand? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, it, by the way, he's okay. <laughs> a few days off, hand healed, everything was all right. But um, that compassion is, is a win-win. Always, always, always. Uh, it, it reminded me of this Ben Franklin tip uh, where he, he talked about how he would win over his enemies. He would win over his enemies by trying to, to do some, some act of compassion, actually. Uh, try to find some, some thing that he could do that would show an enemy that, hey, actually, I'm thinking about you and your needs. Um, he said, interestingly enough, very often they still remained an enemy after that. And the way he could, he could, you know, he argued that he could win anybody over. It was by, uh, by requesting or actually asking for an enemy to show some act of compassion in an area they were strong at. So for example, he, he was notorious for, um, for going to people. Uh, there was, oh, who was the guy who just hated him? I, I'm blanking on his name, but he had this huge collection of books. It was one of the most impressive personal libraries in, you know, of the time. And he went to this guy and he said, hey, um, is, do you happen to have this book? And he says, you bet I do. And he says, oh, I, I, re I really want to read it. Uh, is there any chance I could loan it? I could just borrow it for a short time. And the guy says, as a matter of fact, you can. Uh, here, let me, let, let's go get it. And they went and got, got this book. Franklin read the book. They talked about the book. And, and I'll be darned if they didn't become friends after this. Um, compassion has this weird, this weird, almost magical component, but it's actually neurological, like you were talking about, where when we show people compassion, things start to change. The way we, the way we feel around each other changes in a positive way. Um, and, and I mean, it, it should be obvious. Um, it, it should be obvious, but it's not. But you're right. There is om an almost obsessive focus on self, especially in corporate in corporate settings, uh, self preservation, but also self promotion. Oddly, uh, if you prioritize individual wins over team wins, or, or sorry, if you prioritize individual wins, it usually comes at the expense of team wins. And that, that goes back to um, our earlier episode when I told the Scotty Pippen story of uh, when he was, he, he, only, he wanted to be the guy taking the last shot. And um, the coach was like, well, if you're going to focus on yourself over the team, you're going to have to sit the bench. And sure enough, he did sit the bench and the team succeeded without him. So, um, so anyway, th those are some thoughts. So let's move on to the last one now, evoking, you know, being really curious about people and, and not just because we're forcing ourselves to be curious about someone else, but because we genuinely care. Um, what are what are the failures that leaders that you've seen leaders make with evoking? I am the smartest guy in the room and I don't need your input. <laughs> How many times have we heard and seen that? Uh, my favorite book illustrating the positive is The Multipliers. Um, I forget the, the author. She's from BYU. Uh, fantastic book. These are very tough business people, and they demanded the very best out of their individuals, but they never had to be the smartest person in the room. They were always challenging, always asking, always getting someone to dig in deeper, and they would always perform. As I recall, the story goes, the research for the book, they would interview people and ask, tell me about your boss. Oh, well, Ty Brown, man, he is tough. He, he wants the best out of me. He, I always give him 120%. And they just write off the 120%, saying, yeah, whatever. Okay, he's a great, great guy. He's, he's tough. 
But over and over and over again, people continued to have that theme of 110%, 200%, and so forth. So they started paying attention to that. And it was that fact that these leaders were evoking. They were drawing out. They were challenging the men and women in their organizations to be their very best. And, and why you, you mentioned earlier uh, diversity. Oh, my goodness. None of us is as smart as all of us. We have such a rich, diverse background, even if we look the same. I, you know, you and I, couple, couple male guys sitting in the office, um, yeah. very, very handsome. Obviously. You know, uh, you know, obviously, <laughs> um, good at good at fibbing a little bit, but uh, we're still very diverse academically. That would be challenging. Oh, you're not diverse. You're not this. We need this. I challenge that, saying, if we're not leveraging the diversity that we have be it an all-female team, an all-male team, whatever that may look like, we, we need to. We need to evoke. We need to ask, Ty, what do you think about this? What are your thoughts? Have you ever seen this before? No, man, I've, I've never seen that. Well, Tom, how about you? Sally, how about you? Yeah, that. I, I, I tried and failed at that once. Really? What'd you do? Let's, and, and oh my goodness, the wealth of knowledge and skills and experience that is in a group, wherever it may be, is powerful. Um, it, it reminds me of a, it's a change leadership theory called positive deviance. There's a TED talk on it. Um, this woman and her husband were invited to be um, missionaries in Vietnam back in the 90s. The government brought them in and said, hey, you can stay for six months, but uh, we have this malnutrition issue and if you can't solve it, we're not going to renew your visa. You're out of here. Like, uh, okay. I mean, this isn't, malnutrition is not a put a Band-Aid on it and everything's just peachy. Long story short, they thought, okay, what do we do first? Well, let's weigh all the kids. Let's find if there's anybody who is healthy and above average weight. Sure enough, they found a handful of kids from the poorest of families that had figured this out. Okay, what do we do? Well, let's interview the parents. What are they doing that's different from everybody else that is have these children that are malnourished? But we've got some success stories here. So they began asking, and they were, they were feeding their kids three times a day instead of twice. They were feeding them food that was, wasn't necessarily culturally accepted, but they were doing it, and by golly, the kids were nourished. They were there. So they, they took these positive deviants. They were deviating from the cultural norms, the, the regular practiced things in a very, very positive way. And they had solved a very significant issue. And at the end of the, the time, say six months or what have you, they had made significant progress. They could have brought in food and trucks right. and fattened everybody up. And it's like, right. hey, there we are. Second that ends, it's gone. But it's through asking questions. It's through discovery that you can find solutions to darn near anything. Like instead of thinking outside the box, this was thinking inside your box, inside your organization, inside the poorest of poor villages in Vietnam. Yeah. And, and so if you're a leader and you've got a team and you're not getting their best ideas, that's on, that's on you, leader. Um, it's your job to elicit them. Right. And this evoking principle, it's not so much about lighting a fire under somebody. It's about lighting a fire within. Um, it's almost inception where a leader is helping someone to be inspired uh, to look within themselves, to figure out what matters and then to to go for it, to gun for it on their own. Um, so anyway, that that concludes our time for the day. Um, this has been a lot of fun, Steve. Thanks so much for being on the show. Um, by the way, uh, for those of you, you know, at, at organizations who think that you could use a little infusion to your leadership, um, please reach out to Steve. Uh, he does a lot of consulting for businesses. He's very qualified and skilled at it. And now you know a little bit. There's a little preview for you of, of what he can help bring to your organization. So I'm going to go. Is it OK if I give him your email? Oh, absolutely. OK. So if you want to reach out to Steve, 
Um, check out his website at www.vlrc1.com or email him at steve, that's S-T-E-V-E, at vlrc1.com. Thanks again for being here, Steve. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Until next time, this has been The Ty Brown Show. <laughs>